being in a ketosis state is literally like a thousand light bulbs going off in your brain, like energy, consistency, groundedness, clarity, fog goes away. But also too, then what happens is a side effect of that, your gut's been fed correctly, which then creates the right environment to create the right neurotransmitters that we need for dopamine, serotonin, GABA. That's where they're all made from. G'day everyone and welcome to The Rory Bland Show. G'day legends, this week on The Potty we have got Natalie E. West. She's a friend of mine, she is an incredible clinical psychotherapist, she is an international speaker and she is just an all-around incredible heart-centered human who's doing some really, really cool things. She's helping a lot of people with what she does and we talk a lot, we, like, we go into some juicy topics. It's really fun conversation. We talk a lot about mental health. We talk about her success working with clients and how meat-based diet, carnivore-based eating, primal-based eating has actually helped some of her clients and many people she knows to heal from depression, even eating disorders. It's really interesting chat. We talk also about regenerative agriculture. We talk about plant-based agenda. We jump into a bunch of things. I will also add that we did end up having tech issues on this one. So if you're watching on video, you will see that my face is kind of frozen for when I'm speaking for the first half and then it resumes eventually. So it just wasn't, I wasn't going to waste this interview. It's just got so many value bombs. So enjoy my frozen face. Enjoy the value bombs that Natalie drops. See you in the episode. Today, we've got the lovely Natalie West with us. Welcome, Natalie. Hi, Rory. Thank you so much. We got here. <laughs> we, we got here. We've had a, it's been like a couple of weeks of like tech issues. And for some reason, all the other podcasts have worked, but ours have just, timing hasn't been right. And so now obviously right. we've got some, it's going to be a super good one. The anticipation. I agree. <laughs> so can you tell for people that don't know you, who you are, yeah. what you do, and how did you come to be on the path that you're on? Yeah. So thank you. Uh, so I've been in a psychotherapy mental metabolic space now for over 17 years. So really as a psychotherapist, you know, a lot of the time people think about mental health from a head point of view, uh, but we've also got a body below our chin. So, you know, our gut brain axis is really, really important. So I really work in two pathways, making sure people are aware of how their minds work and especially consciously and unconsciously, but also their bodies around an unconscious layering and, and energy, uh, but also to what we fuel ourselves with. So that's auditory, visual, and also to what we put in our mouth really really important and a lot of the time as you know Rory we were just saying earlier off off, um, off air that you know mental health and food is generally not put together and it's really not um, been discussed a lot so that's kind of been my pathway now for about 17 years and prior to that though I was in corporate for 20 years um, operational management sales management so a lot of interest in the mind and really human behavior really uh, so when I had my first son at 33 I decided that I didn't want to work for anybody anymore uh, and just really went down the route of going you know psychology and then psychotherapy and hypnotherapy and and now also looking at you know nutritional psychiatry as a healing modality uh, for you know mental and physical and metabolic health so yeah that, that's kind of it in a nutshell but yeah been doing this a long time wow that's awesome and and did you have your own health journey or your own path into it or did you just one day wake up and think I'm going to do this well, I'd had my own experience, you know, just with my own programming as a child. And I really didn't understand, especially from a psychology model, just talking about stuff all the time that really just didn't seem to get to the root cause. Uh, and I ended up seeing a psychotherapist myself. And within about two and a half hours, I, I was just, oh, my gosh, now I understand everything. And things just shifted within that two hours. And I'm like, this is exactly what people need to know about. But I was also very lucky. My mentor was an orthomecular nutrition specialist. So he also said to me, Natalie, if you really want to help people and put all the pieces of the puzzle together, you must talk about what people are eating um, because it's so, so important to how we feel both mentally and, and obviously metabolically. Um, I was also from a bodybuilding background. Uh, so eating 
which is really horrific now when I think about it, what I know, I would do things so differently. Uh, eating every three or four hours, very high carb um, way of eating to build muscle and maintain that, you know, physique. But then unfortunately that got me into insulin resistance uh, and I was, you know, pre-diabetic and on the borderline of being a diabetic at like, you know, 59 kilos, <laughs> which is a lot of people are like, what? Um, so for me, I just kind of deep dived into how I could reverse that. I didn't want to go down the path of what normal medical and psychological structure tells you is to go, we'll just give you some insulin. Uh, no, I'm like, no, I'll reverse that. Thank you. <laughs> so that's kind of what really led me more down also to the primal and ancestral way of eating to really help people um, reverse quite serious, either mental health or metabolic issues. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> there's that there's a word you mentioned orthom what, what was that word orthomolecular nutrition okay what is that so literally it's a form of psychiatric nutrition um what they would have called it so people like linus pauling abram hoffer i'm talking you know 1900s here like this has been around for a long time so it's about treating the body as a root cause cellular chemical structure because that's what we are uh we've got to look at what chemicals are actually feeding our body with that actually create the neurotransmitters and the pathways for us to work and function properly uh, and we've really moved so so far away from that where we're disconnecting the psychology with talking therapy without actually understanding that hold on we've got a body here that's also sending signals if we're not feeding it right we're not going to operate properly that makes sense cool thanks for <laughs> clarifying because i'm sure yeah. that other people were like hang on what was that what was that it's it's so interesting though because it, it just seems like well it doesn't seem like it's fact that there are all these different disciplines that are so individual, but it's like that don't connect. It, they literally treat it like the head is not connected to the body. And it blows yeah. my mind knowing what I know now around the gut brain connection, the mm. gut brain access, how uh, head, emo, uh, head, mental, you know, psychiatry, psychologists don't touch food. And then food people don't touch the head. It's like, yeah. when, when did that happen? We're a whole being, right? And, mm. and this is really important. It's like you can go in and talk. And this is what I hear about a lot from the clients that I work with. You know, they're in therapy for so long and they're talking about the same things over and over and over. And no one ever asks them what they eat. So you're really not getting that really deep root cause. So for me, it's about looking at the root cause, especially from pre-programming stage. So pre-cognitive phase of zero to seven conscious unconscious wiring but also too you know i always call our, our gut the first brain like th that's where everything is filtered from uh and and we're not eating real food we're actually eating what i call franken food mm. <laughs> and this is why we're looking at exponential issues with mental health and metabolic disease it's not not by accident uh, spot on franken food is the word i've got in my fridge i've got an impossible burger for for a piece oh, of content i'm not eating it yes, no, don't, don't no, worry don't even uh, give that to any animals <laughs> no i'm not even gonna give that to my pet rats no, no, way. no nothing and on the back i actually saw it's got genetically modified stuff in there as well and people are like i didn't realize that it's like wow this has got mm. that so it's i literally have franken food in my house not normally but it's crazy. And, and I think we're told that these things are supposed to be healthy. They're supposed to be sustainable. But what do, you, what do you think the impact is of all these? It seems like there's all these agendas that are taking us away from actual true health by sharing all these like n nothing wrong with plant-based, but all these like all these healthy alternatives. Like what have you, what are you, are you seeing that there's mm. a negative effect to that or do you think that's fine and and maybe i'm just it's all my head no I, I, there's a whole new i guess a couple of pathways there rory around belief structures and you know the narrative that we're hearing around climate change and the cows and the methane and you know stop eating meat because it's ruining the planet look if we kind of dig a bit deeper into that we know that that's coming from a, a space of really it's led by profit that's why impossible burger and all the other companies are driven and if you dig deeper into that those people are all connected. It's, it's pretty easy to find. Um, but we've moved so far away from understanding what a human needs to thrive, not just to survive, because most people are just surviving, right? Um, and I work with a lot of pre-vegans, vegetarians that really, really got themselves into quite a lot of problems under the guise of cruelty and all of that kind of stuff, which again, is a side note, we can definitely cover that. But, you know, if we're looking at what food is for a human, we really need to go back to ancestors, right? And, and look at what a primal 
food structure is. And it's literally animal-based nutrition. And that's why I heal and I give people that protocol from anything from disordered eating, mental health, to you know, depression and anxiety, and also, you know, um, type two diabetes. It, it, it's not by accident, as I said before, is why we're getting sicker and sicker and sicker, but we've got so much food in inverted commas, right? But again, we're also very malnourished. This is the other thing. We are so malnourished by actually taking away one of the most powerful things that we need, which is protein. And just in, you know, uh, animal product, red meat, we've got all the nine amino acids that we need in one product <clears throat> in bioavailability, <laughs> which is another really important thing that there is bioavailability to the body and there's non-bioavailability. So again, if we look at carbs, plants, those kind of things, they all convert to sugar. Yes, depending on your specific needs and what is going on for you. However, plant-based agendas are an agenda. Um, there is no such thing. Uh, it has just been quite trendy that we're going to kind of look at that. But from a health point and what I've seen over many years, it does not serve, I would say, 90% of the people <laughs> that I work with within 18 months to three year period, people get very, very ill. But the other thing I also want to mention is that it's not talked about a lot is that with vegetables, you know, they're covered in glyphosate, which is weed killer, and it also destroys your microbiome. So that's a lot of other things that we have to really take into consideration around internal toxins, environmental toxins, water as well. Um, there's all layers, right? And we are living in an environmental society where Humans are not designed to live with all of this pollution outside of ourselves, let alone eating glyphosate four or five times a day. And you can see it on the vegetables or the fruit. It's just this white mess and you can't wash it off. You can't. It's in, in the structure of the plant. And as humans, we're actually also not, we don't have the ability in our gut to break down cellulose to actually, so the plant structure the cellulose that we need to break down to get to the nutrients, we're just not designed to do that. You know, so that's the other thing too. Putting glyphosate into your gut every day, that's going to lead to long-term disaster a lot of the time as well. It's so true what you said there. I was literally just speaking to someone yesterday about the fact that this stuff has grown into the food. You can't rinse it off. And okay. that's why they have, you know, Roundup. That's that like they've got a special protocol, right? With how they give you the seeds. And so they spray it so then... Um, you can, so they don't die, so they can keep reproducing. Like it's, it's crafted, right? It's man, yeah. man-made. man-made. And what is, what's that doing to you? Was that around how many years ago? No, it wasn't like every no. vegetable and fruit that you see in on the supermarket never existed. Mm. It is a product of profit. And, you know, the thing is some people that I work with will be on low carb, but that's just more about understanding where that source comes from. But still our soil is so depleted. And like you just said, it's ingrained and everything is genetically modified. Um, but the power of, and this is a really interesting thing, because I do get this asked a lot. Well, it's like, well, what about if a cow was eating glyphosate grass? And I'm like, mm. well, that's the power of a ruminant. They have four stomachs. Um, whereas a human also only has one, right? So ruminants actually, um, there's a recent study that came out where they gave cows a glyphosate diet and a non-glyphosate diet. And then they tested it at the end. There was not one trace of glyphosate because the cow actually processed it all out because they have that capability. It's amazing. Oh. I, I didn't so that's know why that. I always say eat ruminants. <laughs> Far out. That's that's yeah. um, that's very fascinating, and that's that's kind of a relief because at the end of the day, um, God forbid, I, I don't think it'll ever happen. But if if everything was buggered, then we just chuck a bunch of cows and let them do their thing, and then it just, I mean, hopefully, eventually. So well, that's when what we've been doing for years, right? Mm. Millions of years. And, and until all of a sudden we're looking at this cow process as such a bad thing for the environment. And again, we've got to dig deeper into that and go, well, hold on, who's getting paid to do that? <laughs> mm, and I think, I, I think that all the time, the, the, the amount of comments that I get about cows and all the things that both you and I see in our circles, it's, it's ridiculous. And I think we're just misinformed that the thing also, as well as, there is a real thing about the factory farming meat industry yes. being terrible for the environment and yeah. and for animals and the soil. However, we well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about grass-fed and finished, even 
even non-factory farmed grass-fed yes. grain finished are like yeah. much better right but i think yeah. a lot of people think about the you know the the vegan documentaries and you see all that yeah. sort of stuff like that's that's not what it's about no and you know some really great resources for people <clears throat> if they really kind of want to dig deeper into this is the sacred cow um mm. and also kiss the ground documentary it's a really educational process around the fact that what agricultural processing does in relation to releasing all of that chemical into the air and how hot the earth becomes in that kind of processing um and the thing is i think too to like the cognitive distances, I think, with a lot of people is understanding that we have been narrative and being led to believe that vegetables are a hyper part of our diet that we need as human beings to actually survive. We actually don't um, because, you know, myself, I've not touched a vegetable for over four years or fruit. Um, and most of my clients don't that go down that pathway to heal. And, you know, I know people who have been eating this way for 15, 20 years and not touched a vegetable. So we kind of get into this cognitive awareness around going, well, hold on, how can that be? You should be really sick. I'm like, right. I should actually have no hair and be really <laughs> frail or, and not be able to do what I do. So it kind of allows people to understand, well, how does that work then from a biological point if I'm only eating animal-based and fat? Because that's what humans need. <laughs> right. It really is. It's quite simple. But also too, from a mental health point, in a metabolic point, you're getting out of all the toxins out of your body and you're getting your body to heal and uh, get out of inflammation a lot of the time. Mm. It's so true. Gosh, I, I just love everything you're saying. It's just a, it's just a continuation and a reconfirming of the stuff that I've been studying and looking into. And like some of the past conversations I've had, there's, there's like this common thread. And I think there's a lot of people are waking up to these facts as well. Yes. And the more, it seems that animal-based eating, carnival, whatever you want to call it, is getting a lot more traction. It's getting a lot more eyeballs and, and, and attention. And I think that's a good thing because I think it, is breaking this mold of what we think is healthy and isn't healthy. And we have been told eat less beef, right? Red meat's bad, yeah. eat less mm -hmm. chicken, like eat more chicken, white meat. And yeah. if you look at the, the, there's all these graphs, right? Of where you see that uh, red meat consumption has gone down, yes. but yet the problems associated with red meat consumption apparently have We're gone up. up. <laughs> so it can't be that. Yeah, it can't be that no. at all. And, and I'm really lucky and very grateful to have some pretty amazing, you know, medical people around me um, who eat this way. You know, they're, they're full carnivores and zero carb like myself. And, you know, it, it's just not even, and, you know, people will go, oh, it's antidotal. And I'm like, you know what? My clients don't care whether it's antidotal or not. If they've reversed a very, very severe eating disorder with a carnivore way of eating and the, you know, the, 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 the kind of program that I take them through, they don't care. <laughs> Right. But also, too, there is not one study, not one that has causation. So correlation and causation. And a lot of those studies are FFQ. So they're kind of very cherry picked. So frequency food studies. And we know that they really are bad to base a dietary protocol on. But again, if you look at who controls the mass market, it starts to make sense, right? It's big pharma and big food. And the minute that you kind of talk about, oh, it gives you cancer, it's like, well, show me. Show me the study that meat only gives you cancer. It doesn't exist. It does not exist. But again, we're fear-driven to go, oh, remove the red meat. But why? It's just, again, it's a narrative to support a story. Yeah, it's not the kind of story that I'm entertaining either. I put that book down a long time ago. No, thank you. Yeah, did, no, did, thanks. Did you ever do the vegan thing yourself? No, I was a big of a juicer. Um, yeah. But then I kind of realized when I looked back, I'd had quite a lot of um, GI issues and no one could really understand, like severe pain um, after I'd eat and I'd had, you know, those things that they put down your throat and they knock you out and they take biopsies. I can't remember what it's called right now. Um found nothing uh, but now knowing what I was doing back then I was eating a crap load of spinach <laughs> and thinking that that was healthy at that time but spinach is a huge oxalate um, driven vegetable which is actually quite bad and then I realized hold on 
that was all correlation. So once I knew that there was also distension problems, bloating problems, bowel issues, taking all of that out, it all went away. Um, and the same thing that we hear, like, you know, if you eat and bloating, oh, that's normal. I'm sorry to say, but if you're eating and you look like you've got a massive football in your tummy after you eat, that's a problem. That's not normal. Um, same with gas, the amount of gas that you produce, we also get told that that's normal. And that's actually from plant matter sitting in your colon, um, fermenting. Um, and there's an amazing gastroenterologist that even Dr. Paul Mason um, in Sydney, he talks about the fact that humans, it, fiber is deleterious to a human being. It creates problems. We don't need it. And we've also been told we need to poop every day. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> right. We're told we need lots of fiber. I was in the shops yesterday looking for something for my son, like a snack. And I saw something that was like, oh no, it was an ad. It's like double the fiber. I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And double, double the bloating and, and double the packing up of leftover waste in the colon. <laughs> Which is, yeah, it's so the opposite because we're told that meat sits and rots in there and that's yeah, when we become no. stinky. But for me recently in the last two weeks, I've been having like, um, you know, I've been testing pumpkin, zucchini, seeing yes. how my body is going. Uh, yeah. you know, seems to be doing fine. That's good. But then <laughs> Great. garlic, onion, that seemed to be going fine. But then I've noticed after two weeks of testing these things, I'm yep. smelling for the first time in months. And yeah. it's, yeah. And I thought that I would be more regular going to the toilet has not impacted it at all. So it's, um, and yeah, like you said, uh, we don't have to go every day, you know? No. And, and again, the other thing with the whole, you know, oh, meat rots in your gut. Our pH in our gut is like 1.5. <laughs> Nothing's rotting in there, believe me. Um, because the thing is, if you speak to anyone that's on an animal-based way of eating, bloating disappears, gas disappears. They have no issues with going to the toilet because, again, it, it's this programming visualization that we're told um, that, you know, that that's a normal process. It's not. It's leftover waste and that's what's sitting also in our body and as I said earlier like Dr. Brian Yoganathan who's an amazing gastroenterologist in Sydney he sees and puts people on a low fiber to zero fiber diet and it heals all of their their, their issues like constipation so it's kind of like what it goes in the face of what we've been what we've been conditioned to um, and the same with eating all day every day like we're not designed to snack. If you're snacking, you're nutritionally deficient and you're malnourished. And I always say, if you're shopping in the middle aisles of a supermarket, you are malnourished. Cereal is not a food. It's a Franken food. <laughs> and it's just going to elevate your insulin first thing in the morning. And you're going to be on this insulin roller coaster all day. And that leads to, and I'd probably say, Rory, 80% of people nowadays would probably be pre it pre-diabetic and and wouldn't even wouldn't even know interesting because we're eating me. too many carbs and sugars and and carbohydrates again this is may kind of shock a lot of people but you know as, as a human being our requirement for carbohydrates to thrive is zero mm. zero yeah. um it's quite deleterious to a lot of people and i'm like you know like just hearing you say i've had clients that have stripped everything back and we've got their bodies into a really optimal state then they've allowed to add things back in. But what they're doing, they're giving themselves feedback around, oh, that doesn't make me feel good. That's a choice. I'm not going to do that again. Because what happens is when you get your body into a state of ketosis and how you operate and how you feel and how your brain feels, it's a whole new world and you don't want to move away from it. It's true. I literally don't want to include, like I, I want to stay in keto for, you know, I have, I have no intentions of coming out. You know, the fruit is the, the last thing I'm thinking about introducing. Could, could, you, could you talk more about that though? Like the, the connection between like the brain and mental health and the food? Because it's, a, it's a, definitely a fascinating topic, you know, especially this like way of eating, you know? Yeah. So again, we've been led to believe that, you know, we need glucose. So glucose has been told that the brain prefers glucose and that's where we get, um, you know, from our food and in the conversion of carbs into sugar and that's where we get our energy. However, 
we're eating so much that our body is being overloaded with excess of that, right? So our brain, yeah, will use a little bit and we'll get a bit of energy, but it's what I call short burst energy. It's not consistent energy because what we do when we eat, we get the burst, we feel good, but we're also at the same time creating psychological association patterns with taste. So we've got to be really mindful of what we're feeding ourselves with, even emotionally. And I do a lot of work with emotional eating. And it's quite funny, a lot of emotional eaters eat highly sugared foods. They don't eat foods that are good for them, <laughs> right? So when we talk about using the glucose, as I said, we get a short burst, but then our body's going to send us a signal that we want more. So we're just on this constant food hunt, right? And that's not food freedom. Now, your body then gets overloaded with that because we're eating too much and the rest of it, if it's not used, it'll get laid down, okay, get stored. So that's the other issue. Now, when we start removing carbohydrates as in the form of bread, pastas, and even plants, our body then has to start using fat as fuel in the form of being fat adapted and being into a ketosis state. So the brain then uses ketones. And if anyone doesn't know Ben Bickman, he's an amazing PhD scientist out of the US that talks about how powerful uh, ketones are for the brain and on everything from dementia, Alzheimer's, which is now also called type 3 diabetes, which is actually quite interesting. Um, so what your body will do when you're in a state of fully fat adapted and being in ketosis, so your fat cells are then used and then that that fat that you have is then used as your energy source right now if you need glucose your body will make glucose through gluconeogenesis from your liver so that's what it's designed to do but it'll only ever make as much as you need it won't actually over excess right now if you're in ketosis and you've been fat adapted for a while and you have a big protein meal, yeah, that's going to kind of kick you out for a little while, but you're going to get pretty much back into it quite quickly. So you're not going to notice a massive shift in energy. Um, but being in a ketosis state is literally like a thousand light bulbs going off in your brain, like energy, consistency, groundedness, clarity, fog goes away. But also too, then what happens is a side effect of that your gut's been fed correctly, which then creates the right environment to create the right neurotransmitters that we need for dopamine, serotonin, GABA. That's where they're all made from. Like 97% of your serotonin is made from your GI tract in your gut. It's not, it's not here. Um, also to dopamine. Dopamine is also made in your gut, right? So it, it's a very clear driven structure of understanding our body is a cellular chemical factory. We have to give it the right nutrients, which then convert into the right chemicals that make us work properly. Um, and yeah, there is an adjustment because you're going through a lot of withdrawals, cravings, biological, psychological, but it, it's one of the most powerful ways of eating. Um, and you'll only end up finding too when you're fat adapted, as you probably know, Gory, that you maybe eat once or twice a day. And, and you don't look for food. You don't, you, you, you get a signal, you fuel yourself, you eat till you're satiated and then you stop. And then your brain is so free <laughs> just to do what you need to do. Um, so there's no hours and hours of wondering about, oh gosh, now I'm hungry or I'm hangry. That's another thing that people get. And that, that's your insulin dropping now that I need more glucose. So definitely, as I said earlier, humans do not need zero carbs to to thrive um, and especially from a gut point they can be deleterious and lots of things can lead to a leaky gut um, you know we can look even early from kids antibiotics lots of sugars all of those kind of things but long term if you do have a leaky gut then that that causes problems psychological as well versus metabolically so many good points there i, I can speak from experience around the whole you know, it, where it positively affects your brain, right? I don't know if it's because of the ketosis. I don't know if it's because it's, I've removed all these triggers and my gut's actually healing, probably a combination of all. But, it, absolutely. But it's helped me tremendously with my sensory overload and my sensory issues. You know, I haven't been officially diagnosed with autism or ADHD, but yep. I have yep. all the symptoms. Like I actually went to get a blood test today and go to the doctors and be like, hey, can you get yep. me a referral? Because it'd be really interesting to get a diagnosis, right? Yep. And then yep. actually reverse the diagnosis with this, you know, because yeah, yeah. I feel like it's possible. I feel like it's possible well, to at least 
the hardcore symptoms, right? But well, I think also too, I, I was just I'm gonna I think it was yesterday I saw a little study that come up around vitamin D3, but with K2 is also shown to reduce those kind of ADHD kind of on on spectrum um, you know, feelings. But again, long term a lot of the time when you start to fuel your body as you just said in ketosis especially you know for many many years it's been used for epilepsy right so it kind of makes sense as to why if you're in a ketosis state and it stops you having fits well what else is it doing that can also fuel the brain for schizoid disorders and type twos and um dr Chris palmer is another guy i don't know if you know of him but he's written an amazing book called brain energy and talks about the mitochondria energy and how the brain needs energy and it's driven by the mitochondria which is also driven by what we eat um so you know he had a client who had quite bad schizoid disorder uh put him on a, a keto a ketogenic diet um really to lose weight that was the main thing uh and then he noticed that all his you know hallucinations were disappearing and literally went into um remission (laughs) so it's it's a very powerful thing and you know even me i've worked with a lot of people who have alcohol problems um get them into ketosis get their their attachment to the the external source and the anchoring of that whether it's alcohol food or drugs it's no different but it's also connected back to self-programming and self-image negatively from our upbringing and our our programming around us from from authority figures um but yeah ketosis is just i've seen so many powerful changes with people but the thing is once people feel a certain way they realized how bad they had felt and that felt normal to them (laughs) Mm. and they told by also too you know God love our GP, some of them, but they're not really trained in understanding the power of nutrition and they're just told to manage and to cope. And, you know, even with diabetics, it, it blows my mind when you've, you've got type 2 diabetes and, you know, your direction and driven is to say, well, if you, eat, if you eat a bit too many carbs, just give yourself more insulin. I'm like, what? Really? How about we just take out the carbohydrate, get your body to heal and then see how you feel? Did you know the first part of our body to dehydrate is our brain? So if you're not getting enough fluids into your body, then you are going to be missing out on that crucial brain function and all those things that your body needs when it's hydrated. Water doesn't do the trick alone, so that's why I take supplements. I use Sodi Hydration. It's my favorite electrolyte supplement. Perfect blend of sodium, magnesium, and potassium to help you with your needs. I don't really get much in my diet, being on a meat-based diet, and this really helps to supplement, especially if like you're doing nervous system healing or you've got trauma or you're doing gut healing and stuff like that having these kinds of things as a supplement is fantastic so these guys are the creme de la creme in australia big fan they're actually one of my first sponsors throughout all my content here so i'm really grateful to be working with them get 15 percent off using my code rory's kitchen at sodi that's s-o-d-i-i dot com dot a-u and uh, yeah, 15% off. Give it a crack. Let me know what you think. I'm a big fan. They've got citrus, berry, grapefruit, pineapple, great flavors. My body doesn't react. Love it. So yeah, probably have about two of these a day, sometimes three. And it makes a huge difference in my overall well-being, I feel. Actually, I'm going to have one right now. Crack it open. Chuck it in some water. Mm, that's good. If my five-year-old digs it, he's like, can I have some soda? Anyway, on with this week's episode. Okay, so now I'm curious. What like what do you eat? <laughs> okay. So I'll eat when I'm hungry. So breakfast, lunch and dinner doesn't exist because that was also a construct. Um so my first meal generally will be um when I get up anywhere between 7 and 8 8 a.m. So I'll normally have about 6 eggs which are about either poached or fried with butter or tallow with lots of salt. Um amazing goodness in a very big bowl. Um so yeah, up to 6 eggs in the morning uh and now i probably won't eat till two or three two two between two and four maybe um i'll only eat when i'm hungry so i know the difference between my body needing fuel and whether i'm bored so very big difference so then i'll normally eat anything from a steak whether it's porterhouse ribeye tomahawk's my favorite um lots of butter again, and then I'll just eat until I'm satiated. So it can be up to woods of 800 grams, 
in one sitting. Um, I also weight train as well. So sometimes if I'm weight training three or four days a week, I notice I need to uptake that, in, you know, that intake a little bit more. Um, but I also do uh, raw liver in the mornings as a supplement. So I just chop them up, swallow them down with some water. Notice a huge difference from cooking it versus um, I also grew up on organs. So I, was, I'm, I grew up on a farm. So, you know, I, we had cows and sheep and so I'd kind of grown up an awful and all that kind of stuff. So that wasn't new to me. Um, but I do find the difference in my energy when I just have the raw liver on its own. Um, I love ox heart as well, lamb's hearts. I normally just put them in the oven and roast them. They're very fatty goodness. Um, marrow bones are really good. Marrow is amazing for your body. Um, but they're just kind of little things that I just cook on the side and then I'll just put the marrow on the steak and, and things like that. But um, I used to drink coffee don't do coffee anymore. Um, so it's just really water and electrolytes. And that's really it. So pretty consistent every day. Um, don't have to think about food, which is great. <laughs> and I've got a lot of energy, which is amazing. Mm. So you only like eat two times a day, like yep. maybe three. Maybe, usually, if, maybe. If, if I get the signal. You know, um, if, for example, if I've weight trained really heavy and then the, the third meal I may eat would be like just some boiled eggs or some biltong, right? Mm. Um, I know we mentioned barbell before and I, I love them. I totally think they're an amazing product. Um, just a few of them and or just even some slices of butter. It, it's not really difficult. Um, just staying away from that sugar producing, lagging food that really just doesn't serve us. Mm. Amen. It's such a, <laughs> it's such a shift in the way of eating. I've noticed this for myself is your hunger cues change, your relationship yeah. to food changes, your snacking habits change. It is a complete reset. And it got me thinking, maybe I've just was lied to from the beginning about food, all of it. And I'm, I'm, mm. I'm always open to what the truth is. I literally do not care if I have to alter my entire reality as yeah. long as it's the truth and this has just got me thinking what 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 else is wrong about what we've been told about eating you know if we can thrive on animal products long term and you don't need carbohydrates and you don't need these things because you get everything you need as long as you're getting all the cuts the connective tissues the organs everything right. like that as well like yeah it just it just makes you think different but that's that sounds like to me that sounds like a delicious day that sounds perfect yeah i love <laughs> it and and people always say to me don't you get bored i'm like no because our bodies need fuel they need nutrients and you know what the other thing is my body will tell me so if i think that i'm hungry or i'm getting a cue and i go to eat and i can't taste that steak and that steak is like the best thing that i've ever had in my life i'm not hungry there's something else going on because you can't taste it and it's like you just said, and it was perfect. Like your whole structure changes around your attachment to food. You're more connected to food because your connection is back to self. And I've always said, fueling your body that way is a very high form of self-respect. And we have, I'm going to be very clear. I think we have been lied to and it's big, very big construct around big food, big farmer and, and profit. Um, and again, like I said, like, Every single person I've worked with, including my colleagues who are full carnivals, it's like what we like to call ourselves, um, are thriving, right? So it kind of flies in the face of I need my vegetables to be healthy or I need my micro and macronutrients. Again, that's a construct. It's the same thing with calories in, calories out. Absolute bunch of BS. <laughs> it's just ridiculous because calories are energy. That's what they are. So again, it's like, you know, we've got this construct of PTs and all these people and dietitians and whatever giving you, oh, if you have it within your calories, it's like, well, if you're having wheat bix with Nutella every morning, but it's in your calories, that's not food. That's not f fuel, but as long as it's in your calories, right? But again, you're getting sugar, glucose attachment, because if you go outside your calories um, and me being a bodybuilder for so long, like totally got stuck with the whole weighing your food and macros and micros and it was just like oh so overwhelming um even clients that have had eating disorders totally within about a six week to seven week period all gone like it, it's quite mind-blowing and one girl i work with she was weighing herself up to five times a day 
all gone, all gone. <laughs> and she's just like, I never thought I would be in food freedom of just going, you know what? I've never felt this way. She was also an ex-vegan um, and just totally healed herself, totally healed. Yeah. Oh goodness. That is just, I'm so happy to hear that. Thank, thank you for supporting that person with that. That's amazing. People don't know yeah. this, right? Like no. we just, we get stuck and we, I think we just get told that you just have to deal with that. Like this is, it's, it's the new normal, right? Is having yeah. some, some kind of condition is normal now. Correct. And, and also too, you know, handing out really quickly, you know, antidepressants and medication without going, well, hold on, what are you actually filling yourself with? Your body is, is not working properly. And anxiety also too is not just a head construct. It's actually a physiological, biological construct of also giving yourself high amounts of sugar, which if you look at a scan um, on sugar and cocaine, sugar is worse on your brain mm -hmm. than cocaine. Mm. so sugar is one of the most potent drugs in addictions now in today's society i agree yeah I, i'm lucky i never got hooked into it in that sense it's more hooked on potatoes they're good but i don't really miss them anymore but yeah it's it's yeah we're definitely hooked on stuff so the other thing too, it's a social aspect, right? So I always get asked like, oh, what do you do when you go out? And are you concerned about, you know, how you eat? I'm like, no, because my mental and metabolic health is not a community project. I'm, I, I need to walk in my own shoes, right? And unless that community is supportive of my choices, I'm not interested because I don't need to go out and drink or have cake to feel like I'm involved in something. I'll eat before I go. And if I don't, I'll choose protein. It's not that hard. But the other thing is I don't have any attachments or embedments with food being a social thing. It, it, it's not entertainment for me. <laughs> and it's not entertainment now for any of my clients, whereas it used to be. Um, but it's also about understanding the power of how you feel versus fitting in to have a cake because someone else is uncomfortable. I'm like, sorry that, that that's just if you've got a problem with me eating my food and I don't want to eat a cake you need to work out why <laughs> it's got nothing to do with me I love what you said oh, I can't remember the exact words but your food or your well-being is not a community so what project. goes on my plate is not a community project because yeah. it's mental and metabolic health comes first and that's the other thing too a society especially with women and and men I guess in some spaces but Food and exercise has always been used as a, as a punishment to, to shrink yourself, to get yourself into a certain clothing size or to go on a holiday and you starve yourself and you run like a maniac for six weeks and your mental health and metabolic health declines, your cortisol goes up because you're forcing your body to do something, but you're not supporting it with the right fuel, right? So if we kind of tip that around and go, well, let's put our mental and metabolic health first, Weight loss and or fat loss effectively is a side effect of what you do by putting your mental health first. And that's the other thing we don't hear around the psychology element of, well, hold on, mental health is directly correlated and causated both. The minute you put something in your mouth, you're going to get direct feedback short-term and long-term about what that does. we have got to pay attention to the cues. I think we're so disconnected from our bodies that we don't yes. know what signals are going on. And I think when we're so inflamed, when there's so much stuff going on, it's so hard and we're highly strong. It's so hard to know what any of these cues are. So do you have any advice for people to kind of strip back to like a ground zero or a base level? So they actually know how to know what's going on in there. Well, when, when you're on a SAD diet, which is I call SAD anxious and depressed diet, which is a standard Australian or American diet, it's very difficult actually to read any cues um, mentally or physically because we're so addicted, um, both emotionally and and um, taste-wise, right? So again, also to the story of, well, I need this to, you know, I deserve it or I'm going to tick, you know, I did something good today, so I'm going to feed myself. We, us humans eat, whether we're happy, sad, when anything ever happens, we always eat, but this is the other problem. Um, one of the biggest things in conjunction with understanding the signals and the cues in, with the work that I do is helping people become conscious because 90% of what we do is generally 
totally unconscious. We are unconscious human beings operating in unconscious programs, which generally aren't ours, but also too, it's our belief structures that come with that, that we've learned with that zero to seven cognitive phase. So, or pre-cognitive phase. Um, so really it's about understanding the power of the mind, where our mind is and really hold on. It's like, am I hungry or not? What, what What's going on for me right now? Am I stressed? Am I emotional? Am I sad, happy, whatever? But your mind is like a video camera. Every single time you take a step and you process and you do the same thing over and over and over and over, that becomes a new normal pattern. Whether or not you want it or not, because you get, you get conscious about it and go, look, I know I shouldn't be doing that. I know I shouldn't be eating that. But before you finish that statement, you're doing it anyway, because it's an unconscious pattern. So it's really about helping people understand, am I conscious now or am I unconscious patterning in my emotions and the neural pathway that I have hypnotized myself to be in? Because we also do we, what I call a, a state of waking hypnosis. So when you do the same things over and over again, you're hypnotizing yourself because it also be, becomes familiar. So what I need to do is to help people to get into the unfamiliar because when you're in the unfamiliar in the unknown, which a lot of people are quite, oh, that's scary. And it is, right? But that's the only way you can start making changes. It, it's very difficult. Um, and that's why I use the, the mindset and the gut reset at the same time. Because I've even had people come to me that have said, look, I've tried and I've been on an animal-based way of eating for you know, two or three years and I feel amazing, but there's just something that's just kind of not clicking and it's because they're still operating on that unconscious self-image and belief structure. So we've got to get that in conjunction. Um, but also too, people need to stop and sit with themselves. <laughs> Sit in stillness. That's one of the most powerful things that I get my clients to do. Um, sit with yourself. We don't need to be on all the time. But when you're feeding yourself with high sugar and processed foods, you are on all the time because your body's screaming at you to feed it. Gosh, so, so true. I'm, I'm on this journey currently as well of basically stripping everything away. It's called like in the personal growth YouTuber world, there's a term monk mode. Have you heard of that? Ah. And it's, it's really cool. It's um, basically where you strip away certain habits that yep. you know were toxic for you. So it could be mm -hmm. anything. For me, I started it two days ago because I, I there were goals that I wanted to have. And yeah. I realized that if I was going to keep doing what I was doing, I'd have a great year. It would be yeah. awesome, the best year of my life, but I wouldn't get to these goals. And I thought, okay, what do I need to do? And I realized I spend way too much time watching YouTube videos, YouTubers, yep. love it, yep. uh, scrolling. Yep. And scrolling. while I'm working or editing, I would have Twitch or gaming in the background, like people, people yep. playing games. I'm like, what would happen to my life if I removed those things? And instead of me, each moment I go to do these habits, right? And you yes. can replace it with food or whatever else you're doing that, that is a normal habit. What if I just sat there mm. or took a nap or yeah. didn't do something or sat with my feelings and yes. it opens up things that are not normally available because we're so busy we're so on and when you switch off it actually allows you to actually switch on that's what I'm finding so well, I completely relate yeah so in those unconscious pattern behaviors of scrolling or whatever having something on when you stop you're actually driving the, the redirection back to be conscious. And that's what I call that blank slate in between our conscious and unconscious. And what you do then, then rewires the next new neural pathway that will only have a small amount of energy in it in the beginning, right? Because it's new. But the more that you do that in conscious direction, that then becomes your new normal. So the other thing too, you know, on top of food and um you know, movement and, and water, it's also sleep. Like mm -hmm. no one is sleeping because we've got our phones in our faces all the time. And that's also dopamine spikes and hits all the time. We are so dopamine dominant now, um, which is also causing an issue. Um, so again, if people say to me, look, I'm, you know, feeling inflamed and I feel really puffy and I'm like, well, what are you doing between 10 and 2 a.m., 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. in the morning? 
I'm on my phone and the light goes off. I'm like, well, you can't do that. (laughs) You've got to actually put it down because your body doesn't work if you don't sleep properly. It's the top one before anything else. And how do you sleep also too if you're eating a huge amount of sugar before you go to bed? It doesn't work. You can't. You can't. No, you can't. Are you big on the don't eat a couple of hours before your bed thing as well? Absolutely. Yeah. So like my, my last meal will generally wrap up around 4 p.m. Mm. Um, and I'm not hungry because I'm feeding myself protein and fat and fat is satiation, right? So, and also too, once you've fat adapted, like I've done a three-day fast before and I did didn't even really could have went more, but I was just like, well, I don't need to. <laughs> I was like, yeah, no, I'll have some sardines now. Um, but the power of understanding that once your body is recognizing those signals, as you said before, everything just releases. It's like, I'll eat when I'm hungry and, uh, and then I'll stop when I'm not. And that's it. It's pretty simple, but a lot of people will probably find that quite difficult to hear or even be in. Um but yeah, but as you know, once you're there, it's it's pretty amazing. Well, it's it's powerful. This this journey, once you get on the healing journey and you're really, I mean, the thing is a lot of us have been on the healing journey for a long time before we even get to, I think, this kind of thing. But I think when you hit a real sweet spots and you're very aware and conscious of what's going on in your body, what it yeah. needs and everything, you know what's up. So for me right now, I'm a bit tired, but I'm not tired because, I mean, my sleep wasn't great, but... Like there are two things that I want to do currently. One is eat and two is sleep. But yeah. I know like I don't need to eat because I ate about two hours ago. Good yep. meal. Yep. And I don't really need to sleep because I had a decent sleep. Yep. But for me, I know it's because I had like a like a freeze response, a nervous system thing that happened just before the call. Something yes. happened in my life and then it was like, Ugh! And then it shuts my body down. And now I know the habits that I want to move into, right, based on that. So I think that when you strip everything away, you can come back to who you are and you can know what to do then. And so after this, I'll get, I'll do my processes and then I'll be, I'll be good and I won't need to nap or eat. So back to that. And and another thing too, I always am a huge fan of electrolytes, a really good quality. Mm. You know, sometimes when we're a bit tired, we're like, oh, maybe I just haven't had enough electrolytes because it's really important. Right. And then you feel fine. Salt's an amazing, amazing, you know, conducer of understanding when you have some and how you feel from an energy point as well. So yeah. um, It's, it's just a combination. I think of people really just um, open their minds, understand where their resistance is around, well, gosh, what would I do without eating plants? There's a structure behind it, Mm. but also too, we've got to look at what's going on mental metabolically for people that can give them a window (laughs) of opportunity to heal. The body has an amazing capability of healing itself. If you just give it the opportunity. Um, And, you know, Dr. Sean Baker, who's been a massive advocate of, you know, this kind of way of eating for many, many years now, and the amount of people that have reversed such severe inflammation and GERD and rheumatoid arthritis and all kind of autoimmune issues. And we're in an autoimmune issue like epidemic, like it, it's frightening, um, but it's because of what we're eating. Yeah. It's pretty simple. <laughs> it's, we never Absolutely. had these amount of issues and, Um, you know, in my time, I was born in the seventies, right? So never heard of any of these amount of type two diabetics and, you know, lots of different cancers and um, it all autoimmune driven and also too in toxins and environmental. So it's all considerable. Mm, It is. And I think if you look back at menus from a long time ago, I'm not sure if you saw the same thing loop around, but from 1800, uh, there was like a, a menu from like a motel or a pub or something. And I'll have, to, I'll have to find it. If I can find it, I'll link it on yeah, the screen. Yeah. But it's basically a lot of animal products, mostly animal products. The only vegetables, there was no fruit, I don't think. And the, the vegetables was like potatoes done in like six different ways yep. or like zucchini or pumpkin or something like that. And that was basically yep. it. But most of it was animal products, 1800s. Yeah. So again, you know, like if you look even back in the 60s and the 50s and even the 70s, we we were very meat driven culture, right? Mm. And that wasn't a problem then, but all of a sudden it is now. So we've got to also question that. And 
tribals like the Hudsons and you know all of those tribes that they don't have access to the vegetables and the fruits that we do they're not they're not dying of type 2 diabetes they're actually hunter gatherers and eating meat and maybe eating tubers and potatoes they don't have a plethora of different 5,000 different types of grapes like seriously it's just store profit that's all it is totally so what and even you- if you squeeze a broccoli in a supermarket, it's all soft. It's like, what would you even get out of that? Nothing. <laughs> it's it's weird. It's, it's weird. It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> it is weird. Yeah. It is My shopping weird. takes me like literally 15 minutes. It's great. Do you order online or do you go into the shop? Or a bit of both? No, I've got an amazing butcher who just sees me coming and gets it all ready and I get <laughs> points. And yeah, they oh, just, nice. yeah, they're like, no, nope, we know what she wants and lumps it on me once a week. <laughs> Great. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 It's so easy. Saves a lot of time. So what, so we talked about a lot of things. What would be the first, or what would you recommend to someone to get started? Or if they're already started, like what are the next steps they take? Like what's the kind of general advice that you could give to someone listening right now? So I guess it's just really looking at where they are in their life and kind of what, what they're dealing with and what they, they thought or had been led to believe that they couldn't fix or reverse or just had to manage, right? So I would just really start down the track of looking looking at the people that I've already mentioned, start YouTubing, you know, Dr. Paul Mason and Dr. Sean Baker and, you know, even Dr. Anthony Chafee. I've got a lot of YouTube um, videos as well that I've covered off um, that'll talk about a lot of that. So just really start educating yourself. Open your mind and start asking questions. Um, and then, you know what? It's also about making sure you're getting the right support because going from, you know, highly sugar-based diet into something that the mind is going to go, this is restrictive, Um, got to get support in that. But understand why you're doing it and also to making sure you're doing it for yourself. I I just want people really to, to ask themselves, how often do the day are they actually contributing to themselves and nurturing and nourishing themselves versus everyone else outside of themselves. I think that's probably a best place for people to start is to go, what am I doing for me versus what am I trying to do for everyone else and keep everyone else happy and you're kind of depleting and, you know, draining yourself. Um, Yeah. Does that make sense? So much sense. So much sense. So how how do you... Like, do you still work with people in a in a, yeah. a clinical setting? How how do people find you? How do they work with you? Like, yeah. So I've got my website. So it's um www.natalieewest so two e's dot com and there's a link there for let's start here. And what it is, it's a thirty minute free introduction call with me just to have a chat. I need to see where you're at get a feel of how I work and really just talk about what's going on for that person and then just go from there. Um, that's how people generally find me through yeah, watching my podcasts and just referrals from clients a lot of the time. Um, Instagram, Facebook, but yeah, if you really want to start deep diving into a lot of the other topics that I've spoken about is yeah, go to YouTube, but it's under Natalie E. West. So Perfect. So Natalie yeah. E. West on all the platforms basically. Yeah. yeah. yeah fantastic yeah Yeah. that's exciting guys definitely go have a chat with natalie it i'll tell you what working with someone or having someone in your corner is invaluable and i see the amount of people that try to do this on their own in groups and in the comments and sure it's possible and you can get great results but it just gosh to work with someone like natalie a dream just makes life so much easier so go book her calendar out go do it (laughs) is there any other message to the world that you you would share i think people just really need to understand themselves a lot more and actually operate from their own you know desires and what they want in their life and really understand that like i said earlier your life's not a community project. And a lot of the time we try to mold and fit in, um, but we really need to start looking after ourselves first and foremost. And even as a mum and any mums out there that like we've been told that that's selfish or dads, no, not true. We learn that rubbish. Um, Just get back to self and understand what that is for you. Uh, And if you find that eating either a low carb or zero carb or an animal based way of eating is healing you and that, that ruffles feathers on the outside, let it. absolutely you're better off to thrive and have everything else around you try and adapt to you rather than you adapt to 
that you just can't Rory it's just no. wearing too mask too many masks and trying to chameleon yourself in to make other people happy it just it's not it's not worth it it drains you it keeps you out of alignment so also to remember things like depression and anxiety generally for me are a signal that you're out of alignment you're not listening there's a lot of obviously food things that we've spoken about but there's also that connection to what that means for that person yeah so well said thank you thank so you. much this has been so I awesome loved it. yeah this has been really cool so yeah i really appreciate you coming on and i have to come to brisbane because you're in brisbane now aren't you on the gold coast brisbane brisbane yeah i'll come and come up and we can have some steak that's right where, where are you i'm in melbourne oh okay yeah come on up or I've got to go down there for some, I'm going hunting at some stage this year for the first time. Um, oh, well, let me know. Yeah. Probably with the barbell boys. Um, oh, so, wow. Well, I'll find some bear claw ribs for us. Mm. <laughs> and we can good. do that. Yeah. We can Amazing. do it. We can do a thing. That'd be great. Yeah. 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 Awesome. M-E-A-T. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Awesome. I'm so cheesy sometimes. Yeah. Me too. Uh, do you eat cheese? Well, not really. Um, I eat halloumi. Um, sometimes I'll mix parmesan, grated parmesan with butter and put that on top of my steak, which is just like oh, divine. Okay. Yeah. I'm not a, cool. not a, um, ch- like a cheddar cheesy kind of person. Okay. No. Got it. Just yeah. curious. Or yogurt. Or yogurt. Don't really. No. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, sweet. <laughs> just give me fatty meat, mate. I'm happy. I'm with you. <laughs> you know what? You're a legend. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode or watch it if you're on YouTube. It means the world to me. And there's plenty more where this came from as well. So if you'd like to see more content or listen to more podcast content, then you can just hit subscribe on YouTube. If you're on Spotify or iTunes or the other things, five-star rating goes a very, very long way and would be forever grateful. For any of the resources and links mentioned, you can head over to RoryBland.com and you can check out my exclusive newsletter at RoryBland.com newsletter. Thank you again. And I can't wait for you to check out the next one.